Uh, away, no, from away from your hot steam and water. Away from the hot steam and water? Yeah. Oh, I would rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. You better f*** out. I swear to God, I'll f*** you straight in your face. Uh, and pop the f***ing uh, drop the f***. What's up, you guys? Welcome back to Southern Draw Law. My name is James White, criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor, former police officer. By now, I'd say a substantial portion of my audience is at least familiar with or has seen the video of Sonia Massey's killing by Sagamon County, Illinois deputy, Sean Grayson. I will not show the body cam footage in this video, but I will put some different screenshots and stills of the circumstances leading up to it, and I'll link the video in the description so that you can go see them for yourself. I originally had no intention of commenting on this case and quite frankly because look I have a small audience. I have about 75,000 to 80,000 recurring viewers on a monthly basis. John Bryan and Abaya Israel have both covered this story. Both of their videos will be watched by a million plus people probably. And to be honest with you, both of them did a fantastic job covering this incident. But because both of their videos were in production in the very early stages of the information being released, there was a crucial piece of evidence that at this point has not been covered by anyone with the exception of Nate the lawyer, who is also a former police officer and a former prosecutor and is an attorney. That is the reason for me offering my take, and I'll also explore this case from a different angle than I've seen anyone else cover it. So the thing that's been missing from what I've noticed in the reporting of the case is any discussion of Massey actually attempting to throw the hot water towards the deputies. Again, the only channel I've seen highlight this information is Nate the lawyer's channel. There are two different body cams. Deputy Grayson did not turn on his body cam until after he fired the shot. The incident unfolded for several minutes, but from the time the deputy stepped into the house till the time that she was shot is about two and a half minutes that went by. And so Deputy Grayson turns on his body cam after he shoots and that immediately causes it to back up probably a minute to a minute and a half. So in order to actually see the hot water and the pot being held by Sonia Massey, you have to actually watch Deputy Grayson's body cam. And the initial information that came out was that he didn't turn on his body cam until after he shot her. And so there's been a lot of people that probably have just overlooked this portion of the body cam because they figure it wasn't going to capture anything of significance that you couldn't see on the backup deputy's body cam. But the backup deputy had a different angle. He was coming from this angle. And so when Grayson rounds the corner, his body is obscuring the view of the backup deputy's body camera. I want to make it absolutely clear. I am in no way saying that I think this shooting was justified. I believe it was a disgusting display of hubris and ego from a sociopathic police officer who had no regard for the sanctity of human life. I am also not in any way insinuating that the major channels that I mentioned before have intentionally omitted this information. I will say that some of the more agenda-driven, sort of like race-baiting media outlets, certainly have intentionally omitted this information. The way that this incident is being reported is a perfect example of how we can try a case in the court of public opinion using any evidence we want. And we get to leave out whatever we don't like or whatever doesn't work for our agenda. And that sometimes sets us up for disappointment because a court of law is different when we have information that could be potentially exculpatory, i.e., information that would tend to exonerate the defendant altogether, or in a case like this that could potentially be used to justify the actions of the defendant. We don't have the luxury in the course of prosecuting that case of keeping that information to ourselves. We must deal with facts that are adverse to our position in the case. We have to deal with adverse facts because we have a duty to the truth. This is why sometimes you have this enormous expectation that gets created in the court of public opinion, and when the case actually shakes out, the verdict verdict or the disposition of the case is oftentimes disappointing and not aligned with our expectations. Now, sometimes that's because our system of justice has given too much leeway to police officers in the name of the false god of officer safety. And sometimes that's because the people who are gatekeeping the information intentionally kept important aspects of it from public view because they were more worried about their agenda than they were about the truth. And as we've seen recently in the prosecution of Alec Baldwin, it taints the entire case when the prosecution tries to decide what what information is relevant or exculpatory and what information they can just you know conveniently forget about. So what I want to do is deal with the truth of this case and see where the analysis takes us. So I'll start with the basic facts as I understand them. Sonia Massey called dispatch to ask for assistance with a possible prowler. Deputy Sean Grayson and another deputy responded to the home 
It took Massey a while to come to the door, and the deputies noticed a black vehicle in the driveway with substantial damage. When Massey finally answered the door, it became apparent pretty quickly that she was dealing with some mental health issues. We had people like this all over the jurisdiction where I work. The number of times officers on our shifts had to go beat up clothes hanging in a closet to help some poor soul sleep better because she was convinced somebody was in there are innumerable. We had a way of notifying dispatch that the person who lived there was a little bit off. And I can't remember the code. It might have been something like category A or something like that. I can't remember the exact code that we used, but it was clear that it meant to take what was said with a grain of salt because the person was mentally off. Now, I believe the Sagamon County had the same system because you can hear Grayson inform and dispatch that Massey was 1096. And from best I can tell, that's sort of the same thing. Category A, offer meds, crazy person. So from the start, either through observation or dispatch, it should have been pretty clear that she wasn't all together. And apparently he did know that because he ends up asking her whether she's okay mentally. And she says, yeah, I'm taking my medication. And then she starts to shut the door and she tells him that she loves him. And he kind of chuckles. Now they ended up right at the last minute as she's shutting the door asking her about the vehicle in her driveway. And she said it wasn't her. She said somebody dumped it there. And that was cause for them to go and say, well, what, maybe there was a prowler here or maybe it's a stolen vehicle. And so the backup officer goes over to the side of the house and starts running the uh, plate. And so you don't actually hear the conversation with Grayson that led to him going in the house because the back, backup deputy was the only one with the body cam on at that point, And he's over to the side of the house running the plate. So when he comes back, Grayson is already inside. The rest of the case is pretty straightforward. Um, and you've probably already seen it. Grayson is trying to get her to ID to document the incident, but Grayson himself notices there's a pot on the stove and it's a gas stove, so he sees the flame. And he says to his partner to check it. And in response to that, Massey ends up going to take care of it herself. And he ratifies this by saying, yeah, we don't need a fire here. We don't need a fire while we're here. Massey pulls the pot off the stove and then places it by the sink. At that time, the backup deputy starts to create some distance and moves to the corner of the room. Massey notices this and she kind of asks him what he's doing. Both deputies kind of chuckle and Grayson says, trying to get away from your hot steaming water. Away from your hot steaming water. Now, I believe Massey at this point was being playful to the best she could and says, ah, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Now, Grayson, with his 78 IQ caveman brain, and apparently not a very expanded vocabulary, takes the word rebuke as a threat. Now, here's where the legal aspects of this kind of get interesting. At this point, the officers have no reason in considering the Graham factors, which again are, you know, the severity of the offense, um, the threat of escape, the threat to the officer, right? Those are the kind of the, the gram factors broadly. They have no reason to use force. They have no reason to detain her. They have no reason to arrest her. In fact, they invited themselves in the house. I won't say they're in there illegally because, you know, she didn't say she didn't want them in there and she's responded to them and trying to find her stuff, but they certainly don't have any right to seize her in any way whatsoever. They were there on a call for service and they were trying to identify her. Now, it could be that they were trying to identify her because they needed that ID fix that we all know they have a problem with, but it can also be that they want to identify her for the sake of documenting who they dealt with in case there was an actual prowler and something bad happens to her afterwards. They can at least know who they were dealing with and they know who was identified in the house you know, five hours ago when they were there or whatever the situation is. They could have done all they needed to do and should have done all they needed to do from the front porch. But there's no justification under any circumstances for any force to be used at all at this point. And to that point, let's look at the Illinois use of force law and apply it to the facts of this case up to this point. A peace officer is not justified in using force likely to cause death or great bodily harm when there is no longer an imminent threat of great bodily harm to the officer or another. So we're focused on the word imminent in that sentence. A threat of death or serious bodily injury is imminent when, based on the totality of the circumstances, a reasonable officer in the same situation would believe that a person has the present ability, opportunity, and apparent intent to immediately cause death or great bodily harm to the peace officer or another person. An imminent harm is not merely a fear of future harm, no matter how great the fear and no matter how great the likelihood of the harm, but is one that from appearances must be instantly confronted and addressed. That is huge, okay? So none of the police privileges apply to this situation as of now. 
And Grayson, because his vocabulary is clearly limited, thinks being rebuked is a threat, returns that language with a threat to shoot Massey right in her effing face, and almost instantaneously draws his gun and points it at her. And at this point, he is 100% dead wrong. Her immediate response is to submit. She throws her hands up, says she's sorry, and then she ducks down in front of the sink. Now, I ask you to just consider what's going through her mind at this time. Now, we know, we can tell that she's off, that something's going on with her mentally, but what's going through her mind matters. If you paid attention, she's so mentally out of it, she does not make the connection between the dispatcher that she's called for help and the deputies who are standing in her living room. She's confused about her own vehicle. She can't find her ID, and she wants to show the officer some random paperwork that probably has nothing to do with anything. She's done everything they've asked her to do, and she is staring down the barrel of a gun. She's a female, alone in her home, who's called for help, and the help is a huge man pointing a gun at her. He's a big guy. He's standing flat-footed on the porch, and the handle of the screen door is just above his waist, maybe four four to six inches. The same handle is about halfway between her shoulder and elbow. He is towering over her as they're standing beside each other on the porch. Her, The top of her head comes up roughly to somewhere in his chest area. So when you're talking about justifiable use of force, you still have to remember this language. The present ability, opportunity, and apparent intent to immediately cause death or great bodily harm to the peace officer. Do we think that this 120 pound, slightly built woman has the present ability to hit him with a pot of water. When he first draws the gun, by the way, if you look at the where he's standing when he first draws the gun, he's like one of three cushions into a standard size couch that looks like a three seat couch that's usually about six feet. So let's say he's two feet into that six foot space. So he's got four feet in front of him. He's got a standard countertop, which is about two feet. That's six feet. And then she's on the other side of the countertop, somewhere three to four feet past the edge of that countertop. So he's eight to 10 feet away from a 130 pound woman with albeit a pot of water, but still, how is she gonna hit him with that pot of water? And won't its threat be mitigated by just a little bit of distance and everybody just calming all the way freaking down? The answer is yes. His partner is offset by 45 degrees and he's got another four to six feet of distance between them. And of course he doesn't fire his gun. First and foremost, distance, verbal commands, even while he had his gun drawn to have her come back in the living room, maybe a taser which has a range of 21 feet or more. But instead, what does he do? He closes the distance and rounds the corner because she has ducked. And when he rounds the corner, she does raise up, she does grab the pot off the counter, and she does in fact try to hurl it at him. It's plain as day in the body cam. You can see it for yourself. She's coming up, she's grabbing the pot, and she's hurling the pot at him. Now, this is not a good fact for prosecuting the murder case because they will use it as a defense to his conduct. But instead of ignoring it, because we're not operating in the court of public opinion, we have to see where it fits into the analysis. The question becomes, is her grabbing that pot of boiling water and hurling it at him in that moment justification for shooting her? In my opinion, no. And here's why. As we looked at before, using deadly force requires certain things under Illinois law. Again, a peace officer is not justified in using deadly force when there's no longer an imminent threat of bodily injury or harm. Imminent, again, based on the totality, a reasonable officer in the same situation would believe the person has the present ability, opportunity, and apparent intent to immediately cause death or great bodily harm. None of that is here. And it's only here if it is here because he is too close. He has the ability, and I would argue the duty, to step back and create distance in that situation. Because once she throws the pot, it's over with. There's no, you know, there's no real chance that he's getting hurt once all the boiling water spills out on the ground. So my argument is at the time that Grayson drew his weapon, he had no privilege to use any force at all, let alone deadly force. This incident happened inside her home. Why does that matter? Well, because Illinois has a castle doctrine, and she has rights vested in her by the castle doctrine. That means she is the one with the privilege of self-defense in this incident at this time.
The second that Grayson used unjustifiable force inside her home, drew his gun, and threatened to shoot her in the face, he converted himself from a police officer privileged to use force under reasonable circumstances to just a regular dude committing the offense of assault with a deadly weapon or aggravated assault or however you want to classify it, standing in someone else's home as the primary aggressor in a use of force scenario. That created a reasonable fear of death or serious bodily injury in her and empowered her to use any and all force to protect herself from this unlawful threat. So in my opinion, her actions indicate to me that she initially submitted to a show of authority, throw up her hands, said I'm sorry, and only when he decided to advance on her and come around the corner did she react raise up, grab the pot, and throw it at him. Had she had a gun, it would be my opinion, and I would argue this all day long with a straight face, that she could have legally shot him in that moment because he was in her house using an unlawful amount of force and pointing a gun at her, threatening her life, telling her he was going to shoot her in the face. She had the right to self-defense against a deadly threat. And how could you not believe that she was afraid for her own safety in that moment? And we know now, rightfully so, had he moved backwards, vacated the house, given verbal commands, or anything besides escalate, 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 we would not be here. In closing, truth and justice have no agenda. It serves a lady wearing a blindfold. She doesn't care about race. She doesn't care about politics. She cares about truth. The truth is the fact that she grabbed the pot and hurled it at them gives them something to work with as a defense and it must be dealt with. Again, the prosecutor knows this. They know they don't get the luxury of leaving details out. Why do you think he's been charged not only with murder, but with aggravated battery with a firearm and official misconduct? The answer is that those other charges paved the way for the murder conviction. Let me explain. They know she hurled the water, and they will deal with that probably in the way that I've described here. The paving of the road and the first leg starts with official misconduct. Official misconduct under Illinois law says a public officer, employee, or special government agent commits misconduct when, in his official capacity or capacity as a special government agent, he or she commits any of the following acts. And then subsection two, knowingly performs an act which he knows is forbidden by law to perform. Okay, so official misconduct. That takes him out of the privilege of a normal police officer. So we now know when the prosecutor's laying out the road, he didn't have a right to do what he did. What's the next leg of the road? Aggravated battery with a firearm. Battery generally defined as creating physical contact of an insulting or provoking nature, aggravated based on the serious bodily injury component. So the three shots that entered her body represent physical contact of an insulting or provoking nature. And the great bodily injury is what makes it aggravated and the gun makes it an enhancement under the law. And I think the range of sentencing is like 15 to 60 years under that statute. And then of course, the last leg of the road is the murder because she died from the injuries sustained in the unlawful battery. So the prosecution knows she grabbed the pot. They have to first show that he stepped outside of his authority, and that's the misconduct charge. They have to show that he is the primary aggressor, that he doesn't have a privilege to use force, and that's the battery charge, which created a right to self-defense for her, and then the murder when the unjustified use of force led to her death. I expect a conviction in this case, and I expect that he'll spend the rest of his life in prison, and there will be a huge payout from the lawsuit. I invite you to go back and watch the whole interaction. It will be hard, but we need to see it. Pay attention to the absolute depravity and callous and soulless conduct of this police officer, both before and after the shooting. If you pay close attention, you'll notice he kind of chuckles when he's communicating. He does it on the front porch when he asks her about the car, and he's talking about, you know, well, that's not your car, and he kind of laughs when he's communicating. He does it again when he tells her that he needs her ID and that she shouldn't have a hard time remembering what her last name is, and he says, do you have a driver's license? And he chuckles again, and he does it a third time when his partner says he's going to get his med kit and he, he tells his partner not to get the med kit because that's a headshot. He chuckles when he says that's a headshot. She's done. You can go get it. But she's done. It's like he's playing Call of Duty not witnessing the final moments of a human being's life. He further says he's not going to waste his medical stuff on her. And outside, when his fellow officers are asking about it, he says that effing bitch is crazy. He even suggested that she set the whole thing up. When he first got on the porch, he made a comment about her hiding her drugs before she answered the door. And then after he shot her, he said all the rest of this stuff. That's right, guys. The lady who was suffering so much from mental health and called them for help who was so out of it that she didn't even recognize her own vehicle, and who attended to the pot that he drew attention to, 
and followed all of his commands, was trying to set him up, all 120, 130 pounds of her, out to get him. These are the people wearing the shoulder patch and the weight of the government in their badges in 2024. Something has to change. Anyway, that's all for this one, guys. My condolences to the Massey family. Um, thanks for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe, leave a comment on the video. Check out some of the other videos on the channel, leave a comment on there as well. Until I see you again, take care. Always film your interactions with the police. And keep your evidence to yourself.